Life Over Coffee. Conversations for Transformation. Sometimes when people hear the term biblical counseling, they think about a two-tier system within Christianity. What I mean by that is there are those who can counsel and those who cannot counsel. When I talk to some Christians about biblical counseling, you can almost see them mentally stepping back while disqualifying themselves by saying something like, oh, I I can't do that. For them, biblical counseling connotes that two-tier structure of competency or something that is for professionals versus the non-professional. Now, this problem, among a few other liabilities within the biblical counseling movement, I think it makes it wise to change our thinking about how we do soul care, and that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. Hello, everybody. This is Rick Thomas. Thank you so much for joining me for Life Over Coffee. Make your way over to our coffee shop. It is lifeovercoffee.com. We have literally thousands of free resources waiting for you in a read, watch, listen format. If you like to read, we got it. If you want to watch, there are over a thousand videos. If you want to listen, well, there's over a thousand podcasts as well. I've titled this, Did You Know There Is a Better Way to Do Counseling? Now, I just recently wrote an article and did a podcast where we pretended we had this case study with the prodigal son who was sitting in front of you or sitting in front of me in our counseling office and he was stewing in anger and rebellion. He was resisting all of your attempts to help him. Of course, you're looking at this scenario through the rearview lens, and so you've read the story in Luke 15, specifically verses 11 through 17, and you know that the Lord did not grant repentance to this stewing, brewing, rebellious young man until verse 17. But here's the issue. In our pretend story, he comes to you. He's planning on living, uh, leaving home to live independently from his family. But while he is sitting with you, he is in verse 12. And so there is a, a long distance between when you are talking to him and when he eventually comes to his senses. And so during your time with him, you learn many things that are awry with his thinking, not to mention he has a whack theological perspective. And your hope is, is for him to change while meeting with you. But you are working within a traditional biblical counseling window of opportunity. You have maybe six, eight sessions to get him to change his mind, to bring him to a place of repentance. And you can only speculate as we look back through that rearview mirror. It may take him two years to get from verse 12 to verse 17. You know all the things that he did there in that story of the prodigal son. The historical biblical counseling model does not work in this situation because of the prodigal's determination to rebel. His rebellion is going to outlast your opportunities to encourage him to repent. Every parent, or many parents, maybe most parents, have had this struggle. They have a limited window of opportunity to help their child change, and it's just not enough time. Well, that kind of gives you a perspective of what biblical counseling is. If it's going to take this long to change, but you only have a limited amount of time with them, well, your goal would be to string out the counseling sessions, but you can't. You have a small, tiny watering and planting season. Now, this situation with the prodigal, it's just a fictional illustration, but it is all too real. It happens all the time within a biblical counseling framework. Short window of opportunity when transformation 
is an extended process in that person's life. And this situation is where we need a better system for working with people who need our wisdom, but they are not yet ready to change. This system, it has to be a system that can work within the flow of a person's progressive sanctification. Or maybe God hasn't saved them at all. And so we're not talking about pro progressive sanctification, but we're talking about salvation, evangelism. Regardless, that system must be able to plod along while being patient as we build the relational bridges to carry truth over to them, hoping to bring that person to Christ or into a deeper understanding and experience with Christ. I shared with you in the last podcast my story, which is not an outlier at all. After I got out of jail as a 15-year-old teenager, I wanted to change, but the process of change, it had to be more than just meeting with someone for a series of, of sessions. My troubles were too long-standing, and my complexity was too ensconced in my soul. As I looked through the rearview mirror, it was another 10 years before I came to Christ. People with problems, especially life-dominating ones, need long-term soul care in multiple contexts to experience radical worldview-shifting transformation. Traditional biblical counseling is not that system. Now, perhaps it can be part maybe a subset that fits up inside of a grander model of soul care, a subset of the larger framework. I've been counseling for a long time, and I can tell you that most counseling does not work in a five-and-done or a ten-and-done counseling sessions. If what we mean by work, that person comes to you and they experience repentance. Now, if that's what we mean by success or counseling working, it doesn't work. The majority of counseling success happens outside of that season of counseling. The unchanging prodigal wants to sow his wild oats, while the biblical counselor intends to guide him toward righteous repentance. Guess what? We call that an impasse in the counseling office. And if the counselor is not careful, his plan, his expectation will press his counselee between a rock and a hard place. There will be a strange tension in the counselor's office as the counselor pushes him to repent while God does not grant him the gift of repentance. Have you ever counseled someone and within the first or Second session, meeting with them, they have repented and made significant changes in their life that was sustaining, ongoing. Well, if so, you know what happened? You happened to catch them in verse 17 of Luke's gospel where it says the prodigal came to his senses. You happened to be very lucky that day, and you were meeting with that individual on the day that God granted repentance to him. They received the gift of repentance from God, and you just happened to be sitting in front of them when God granted it. Now, that doesn't happen often, but when it does, it makes counseling a pleasant experience for everyone. Years ago, excuse me, years ago, an adulterous lady told me, she said, Rick, you are an excellent counselor. She came to me for counseling, and through the counseling process, she actually changed. She really did. Eventually, she repented. She jumped on the road to Christian maturity, now, I didn't tell her what I was thinking, but the truth is that I'm not that great of a counselor. I just happened to be in front of her when God broke into her stubborn, cold heart. It was my lucky day, and it was hers too. 
For those of you who struggle with the word luck, let's just call it sovereign luck. It was my sovereign lucky day to be sitting there when God just imposed himself into her life and granted repentance. There's also a reason my 15 previous counselees before her, they did not change. God did not give them repentance like they did to this cold-hearted adulteress lady. After the Lord granted repentance, she humbled herself. She received grace. She repented of her sin, and the Lord began to change her life. Let's give credit where credit is due. No, dear lady, I'm not that great of a counselor. I just happened to be sitting in front of you when the counselor showed up and broke into your crusty heart. It was because the good Lord brought her to her senses just like the prodigal son. He chose to grant this adulterous counselee repentance and from that point forward, it was like painting by numbers. Any counselor will be an excellent counselor when the counselee decides to change. Some biblical counselors can just put too much pressure on themselves to fix people. If the counselor's understanding of the Lord's role in the counseling is inadequate or they do not include the local church in the person's process for change. If the counselor does not have a vital discipleship church context, the counseling will have built-in liabilities which will be a setup for unnecessary frustration for everyone. The counselor can become frustrated and impatient. The counselee can become frustrated because they're being pressed to repent. Mama will be frustrated because her teenage boy doesn't repent because she has put too much hope in the counseling process. People will ask me, say, hey, Rick, do you do counseling at your church? That's a trick question. I do biblical counseling. I put that in air quotes. I do biblical counseling at my church because I am a a Christian. I mean, okay, every church member is a biblical counselor. I'm assuming that every church member is a Christian. Every church member is a biblical counseling a counselor, whether they know it or not, whether they do it like me or not. Because the Bible assumes that every church member is a Christian and every Christian does the work of discipleship. The issue here is not whether I am for biblical counseling. It's like, Rick, you're like against biblical counseling? No, I never said that. Never have said that. I've always been for biblical counseling. God has used biblical counseling in my life in a a profound way, not only for personal transformation, but it has given me a platform and he has God has helped many people through the framework of biblical counseling as I teach it. I'm trained to do biblical counseling. I pursued my ACBC fellowship because of my affection for biblical counseling. Started this ministry to spread my passion for biblical counseling to the Christian community. My love for biblical counseling is strong and unassailable. But I have a greater appreciation a transcending appreciation for the New Testament local church doing the work of soul care, what the Bible has always assumed as discipleship. Because of my affection for the local church, I want to go the extra mile in not creating or implying a two-headed model of discipleship within the local church, those who can, those who can't. All biblical counselors believe that every Christian should participate in the counseling process at some level. Jay Adams has served us well in communicating this truth since his groundbreaking work in 1970. His book, Competent to Counsel, set a new trajectory for the local church's total involvement in counseling. He repackaged and relaunched the idea of counseling in a compelling way that has served multiplied thousands of churches. And though God has used Jay to do this fantastic work, I have observed that too many local churches 
are lacking in total engagement in a comprehensive view and, and practice of counseling, which is really called discipleship. And that is the word that I prefer above all. By the way, discipleship is the very thing that Jay, Jay said that we should be doing. Though everyone can and should care for others, most of the heavy lifting of counseling or discipleship happens among a few people rather than all the people. Part of the reason for this is that biblical counseling has taken on a life within the local church over the past few decades. In some ways, it has mutated into an extension of the church or para-help. Para means alongside of help. It comes alongside the church to assist because the church is deficient in their sanctification processes. Or even worse, they don't know how to do soul care. They don't know how to disciple. Not every church, but many churches. Part of the reason for this is the reclassification of the counseling process. Biblical counseling has become the new appellation that we map over the more appropriate and biblical term, discipleship. Many people see two terms as two different needs for the Christian. Biblical counseling has unintentionally weakened the function of discipleship in the local church. It would be better to rename, restate, reclassify biblical counseling according to its biblical roots. Biblical counseling, by definition, is too narrow of a term to encompass what we all should be doing. The term connotes a specialist or trained individual who is a professional. The word can also lead a person to believe that the average Christian is not qualified to bring counsel to someone else. Though we need some specificity, we do need some precision, we do need training in the discipleship process for specific situations, but that is a whole other story because many biblical counselors, even though they have certification and they call themselves biblical counselors, even they do not have that precision, that ability to deal with specificity, to, to have the training to deal with specific situations. Ultimately, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. If we do not broaden what it means to care for each other, we must envision the entire church Everyone should participate in the, in, in the counseling process at some level according to their person's God-given gifting. Now, that's something that we are very meticulous about here at lifeovercoffee.com. We have a mastermind program where we train people in biblical counseling, and there are five distinct areas that we are assessing all the time in this order. The person's character is foundational, and then the person's capacity. What is their, what is their ceiling? And then the person's competency, that is the training that goes inside their capacity, whatever their capacity may be. And then number four is courage. It takes a lot of courage to speak into people's life. And then compassion. We must do it with compassion. And so it is important that we broaden out the scope of what it means to be a disciple maker and that we envision that we equip the local church to do it according to their God-given gifting. Instead of calling what we do counseling, let's just call it discipleship. It always has been for the entire time of the New Testament. Discipleship is more nuanced. Discipleship gets into the nooks and crannies of the local church's sanctification model. We don't want to reduce the number of people doing discipleship. No, we want to broaden it out, expose it to the entire body of Christ. We don't want to set up unnecessary artificial context called counseling sessions that can manipulate or attempt to press righteousness on a person prematurely. This self-imposed pressure for holy living for righteousness. It creates non-God-ordained timelines for change. My earlier reframing of the story about the prodigal illustrates the liability of attempting to press righteousness 
in an artificial context. I long for the day when discipleship reclaims its biblical heritage by taking over biblical counseling through the engagement of the entire local church in a fully orbed, powerful, one another body ministry. This is a substantial philosophical and methodological difference between counseling the prodigal son in a counseling context versus spending time with the prodigal son at different points along his journey. It's called doing life in the milieu, meaning meeting with him in the social environments in which he is living. Practicing discipleship has many more advantages than biblical counseling. One of those advantages is it does not press the issue of repentance on a person, but it is pneumatic, meaning it is spirit-led, which means many things. It, it builds, it, it plods, it speaks, it comforts, it convicts, it, it confronts, it changes. Pneumatic soul care, discipleship. Discipleship and counseling are as different as the tortoise and the hare. The tortoise is poised and strategic, deliberate, well-paced, and systematic. The hare has a job to do. It's about getting it done as fast as possible. Now, the hare may also be strategic and methodical, but therein lies the problem. His strategy is to accomplish the task today because counseling is not an open-ended arrangement or expectation which can put counseling at odds with God's plan for repentance for the person that they are counseling. But if you practice discipleship rather than counseling, you know it's easier to keep the person in the building, the church building, rather than trying to get him to come back to an artificial context for change like a counseling office. We use this, when when I was pastoring, we used this term, just keep them in the building. We wanted to keep them in the building where they uh, experience all the sanctification context of a local church with the whole body engaging the individual. It's a much better model. And so keeping them in the building was just a shorthand way of saying that discipleship, this sanctification context, is better than the intense, let's sit down in an office and we're going to get you to change today. Loving a person is easier while doing life with them rather than trying to love him during a counseling session where you call him to repentance every time that you meet with him. How exasperating. You can only do this for so long. And you might not be calling him to repentance every time that you meet with him, but there's an expectation of change every time you meet with him. And if he doesn't do his homework, he hasn't changed this or that, and it's been six weeks, there are more advantages to discipleship in the local church when the entire church body is engaged. Let me give you a handful of examples. The church can love and serve the prodigal. The church can love and care for the prodigal's family. The church can model the life of Christ before him. The church can connect other members of the body to everyone, the prodigal and his family. The church can provide hospitality. Hey, come over for a meal. The church can provide a small group. Hey, we'd love for you to be in our small group. The church can do lunch with them. Got time to do lunch next Tuesday? Let's do that. The church can plan fun events with them. Want to go to the basketball game? The church can engage them at weekly church meetings Sunday morning. The church can provide biblical counseling. The church can patiently wait and pray for the Lord to grant repentance. And that is just a short list. Now, what about if you added five more things to my list just for the fun of it? There's not a biblical counselor in the land that can provide this many things for anyone and their family. Suppose you can keep a person in the building long enough. In that case, the likelihood of him repenting in God's good and kind providence is more likely 
than five and done counseling sessions while sending them away with no regular connectivity to the body of Christ. By the way, that is a problem too. Because after you meet with them for six sessions, there is, a, there is an aspect of unkindness in that. You meet with them, not intentionally, not ill-motivated. I'm just saying because of the insufficiency of the model, that you meet with them and send them back out into the wild. They have no connectivity to the body. Keeping them in the building is not a static responsibility. It is spontaneous. It is structured, meaning it is pneumatic as stuff happens in that individual's life and you have structure for this person, context for this person to be part of. It consistently provides love and care for those who need to change, to grow, to mature in Christ. The counseling office, on the other hand, has a singular focus. I need for you to change soon. Discipleship in the context of the local church is more of a relaxed environment. It permits people to live in the gospel's good while coming alongside each other, helping them to follow their example. Follow me as I follow Christ. Discipleship is hard work. It's not for the lazy person. All hands are on deck and everyone is busy thinking about living in the good of the gospel while inviting others into their faith walk with Christ. Counseling has a counselor sitting in a chair instructing another person on how to live for Christ. Discipleship is about doing real life with another human being while speaking into his life along the way, which, by the way, is how Jesus did it. What would Jesus do? The counselor's challenge is building a robust relational bridge so that he can trot difficult truth of God's word over to that person in love. The counseling context is almost like picking someone out of the crowd and sitting them down in front of you and bringing complex correction to them. By the way, a lot of counseling is like that because the counselor does not know the counselee. And so it is random stranger from um, this place over here that comes to meet you and you have some very difficult things to, to say to them. Most discipleship happens among close friends. Most counselors are in the unenviable position of correcting someone they hardly know. Here is my tongue-in-cheek five-step approach to biblical counseling between two people who do not have a prior relationship with each other. They come into the office, and here's how it goes in five easy steps. Hello, my name is Rick. Please tell me your name. Step two, Wonderful. Now tell me why you are here. Step three, I love you very much. Step four, you're making a big mistake and continuing down your current path would be foolish, so stop doing that. Number five, will you come back next week so we can continue our discussion? Now my five-step approach to counseling is hyperbole but you can sense the liabilities intrinsic to the counseling process. And to add to this, and to heighten the degree of difficulty, you have approximately 60 minutes to demonstrate your love for this person while you're bringing correction to them. Go. Now, this is, this is one of the reasons that I, have, I don't counsel for 60 minutes, never have. I've always counseled for two hours, been doing as long as I can remember, but I implemented two hour, that's minimal, by the way. I, I have counseled as long as uh, five and a half hours, uh, but that's only for those who have extraordinary stamina, uh, but at least two hours with few exceptions unless they, they got to catch a train or something. Uh, but two hours minimal is my counseling approach because it is an artificial construct with a stranger. Most of the time, I'm trying to win them over. I want them to know that I care for them, but yet I also know I have complex things that I need to say to them and I need to build that relational bridge. And so you have 60 minutes to get to know them, love them, give them hope, call them to repent repentance and hope to create a desire in them to return to you next week for more of the same. Good luck with that weak model for progressive sanctification if it is outside of a sanctification center. Code 
the local church. The local church discipleship process has a different setup altogether. It can include specific one-to-one discipleship, or what some people call biblical counseling. Yes, it can include that, but it can include so much more. It has been my experience that if the whole church lived in a gospel-centered life, there would not be much need for all the formalized biblical counseling that we see today. I've titled this, There is a, there is a Better Way to Do Counseling. Now, I want to wrap up now. You can read everything that I have shared to you at lifeovercoffee.com. Uh, there is a better way to do uh, counseling, and you can read all of this. You can watch it, listen to the podcast. But let me wrap up by asking you a handful of questions. Number one, why is a discipleship model in the local church context a better approach to help folks change than an isolated counseling model? Number two, Traditional biblical counseling can be a subset of the grander discipleship methodology, but if it is not, what are some of the liabilities of a standalone counseling ministry? Number three, if you work within a narrow biblical counseling framework disconnected from a comprehensive model of discipleship in the local church, how will you help those you counsel to maintain their transformation after you stop meeting with them? After you send them back into the wild after six or 12 sessions? We know that sin never sleeps, that we are fallen people in a fallen world. It's an unreasonable expectation to meet with someone for a limited amount of time and then have no way, no means of grace for them to partake in so that it can continue the transformation, assuming that it happened during the counseling season. Number four, is your local church coming alongside you to help you with the soul care of those that you hope will change? You want that local church environment, that context, those different milieus, those social environments, so that those that you are helping can participate in them as you are helping them specifically. Number five, are you doing your part as a Christian counselor, and that I mean disciple, or in your church? If you are not doing the work of disciple making, why not go and make disciples, someone once said. Number six, what would need to change in your church to make it more a more effective sanctification center? Again, I titled this, Did You Know There Is a Better Way to Do Counseling? If you want to learn how to do discipleship or biblical counseling, we do have our mastermind program. It's a two to three year program. It covers those five areas that I talked about earlier, character, capacity, competency, courage, and compassion. Uh, We deal with uh, help with theology and then understanding sanctification concepts or what some would call psychology. And then, of course, the practicum, the application, all that just stacks up theology, psychology, and the application thereof. And so we work in those three spheres. Uh, If you're interested in our mastermind program, I would encourage you to, we have a free LMS and you can jump on that learning management system and just find out all about it. And if you have questions, just uh, submit a question through our contact feature on our website at lifeovercoffee.com. And if you don't get all your answers to the free informational LMS, we would love to work with you and answer whatever questions you have. There is a better way to do counseling. And I trust that you are encouraged and that you're ready to get going serving those whom you love. Thanks for joining us. Learn more and get access to other resources at lifeovercoffee.com.